Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2024 Dirty Dozen List Reveal. We are thrilled to have you with us. I'm Lynn Nealon, Vice President and Director of Corporate Advocacy at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Nicosi exists to build a world where people can live and love free from sexual abuse and exploitation. We do this by catalyzing mass scale prevention, by challenging institutional and societal enablers of sexual exploitation. Our relentless team does this through public policy, by advancing laws to protect and penalize, through civil litigation, activating the courts to confront sexual exploitation, and through corporate advocacy, challenging industry leaders to prioritize dignity over profit, which is of course, which of course includes galvanizing the public through campaigns like the one we're launching today. Just to share briefly uh, what the next hour will look like, we will share the goals of the Dirty Dozen list and highlight a few of the victories that we've had even just this past year. We will play a video revealing the full 2024 list. I will then be joined by six of my colleagues and together we will highlight the targets that we have chosen for this year's Dirty Dozen. And then we will open it up to Q&A. And a note about that, please do put your questions in the Q&A function. We will not be monitoring the chat for questions. Put it in the Q&A function and please identify your name and affiliation. Also, please know that we will be addressing some egregious harms perpetuated against people, against children and adults alike. And we will be sharing some visual evidence that we've collected. It is not the most egregious of the things that we have seen and it is heavily blurred, but please do take care of yourselves. So what is the Dirty Dozen list? This list names 12 mainstream institutions that facilitate, normalize, and often benefit from sexual exploitation. And unfortunately, oftentimes from many forms of exploitation. This may include child sex abuse, rape, sexual extortion, often called sextortion, prostitution, sex trafficking, image-based abuse, et cetera. These entities exert enormous influence and power, politically, economically, socially, and culturally, with several corporations on this list enjoying more resources and global recognition than entire nations. This list is comprised of corporations, brands, organizations, and agencies that you likely know and love. Entities you may have even used today, either to send pictures to grandparents, purchase a gift for a friend, or to unwind listening to music. Yet while we can acknowledge and appreciate the good that they provide us, the great products, the entertainment, necessary services, it is also critical that we as users, consumers, shareholders, investors, are aware that they are also enabling violence and harm. How? By inherently dangerous product design, through insufficient policies or lack of enforcement of what's on paper, by buttressing the infrastructure of abusive entities, or by simply turning a blind eye in order to protect their bottom line. And some are truly acting as perpetrators themselves due to their algorithms and approaches to user engagement. The goal of the Dirty Dozen list is to put enough pressure on these institutions that they change their problematic practices and proactively advance a culture of dignity, both within their companies and industries at large and throughout society. It is fitting that we are launching this year's Dirty Dozen list in April, a month dedicated to child abuse prevention, as well as Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. This must serve as a solemn reminder that it is very often largely women and children who are most disproportionately targeted and traumatized by sexual abuse and exploitation. And even more so if they are women and children of color or identify as LGBTQ. Every year now, every year since 2020 when COVID hit, it seems to be getting worse than the previous year. And in fact, the data shows that that truly is the case. For example, the Internet Watch Foundation found that 2023, was a year where they saw online grooming of children under 10 accelerating, quote, like never before, as the hotline discovered record amounts of child sex abuse. The National Center on Missing and Exploited Children have noted increases every year since 2020 in child sex abuse material, online enticement, and obscene material sent to children. And the FBI has been issued repeated, almost frantic warnings to parents about a growing threat of sexual extortion, again, often called sextortion, especially among teenage boys. 
and with the AI, AI arms race in which major tech companies are in which major tech companies are engaging, we are witnessing an even greater acceleration and proliferation of not only child sex abuse content, but of image-based sexual abuse against adults, again, mostly against women, in the form of AI-generated deepfake pornography. Graphica reported that in 2023, the number of links ad advertising undressing apps increased more than 2,400% across media platforms like Reddit and X in this past year. This must stop. We must make 2024 the pivotal year in which we start seeing improvements for young and old alike all over the world. Many of these targets have the power and the ability and the resources to make principal decisions that could dra dramatically alter the course of the highly destructive digital landscape. Most of the companies we're calling out have lofty corporate responsibility statements and have launched ethical AI task forces. We're challenging them to actually live up to those statements and fulfill their social obligations to do something with the urgency these harms require. Now, I know it can seem that these institutions are untouchable, unmovable, remain largely unaccountable. I myself have entered this work very skeptical. Um, even the most optimistic of us can feel daunted, but we have seen so much progress in the decade that the Dirty Dozen list has been active. And the good news is that together we truly can make a difference. I want to highlight these victories before we go into the targets to leave you with hope that change is possible and to really inspire you that it is everybody taking action that really galvanizes um, major improvements across major corporations. You can read more in a blog that we recently uh, released about the victories. I just want to highlight um, some of my favorites. Uh, one was that Google finally, after years of pressing on them, um, finally turn, automatically turned on safe search for everybody. So that means that 5.3 billion Google searches per day no longer expose unsuspecting children or adults to pornography. These are the types of common sense measures that we are pushing on all of the corporations to adopt. And when, with Google making this big change, it sets a precedent and sets industry standards that we can also point to and putting some positive pressure on these other um, entities. Just one quote, we always do thank the corporations when they do make positive changes. And we received dozens of supporters um, signing a petition that we then shared with Google. Um, and one in particular said, this is an amazing step to improve the lives of people everywhere. I have family who develop pornography addictions through accidental exposure from Google. Huge step, so thankful for your efforts. And Google themselves publicly noted that it was through the National Center on Sexual Exploitation's campaign and supporters calling Google, pleading with Google to make this change that they, in fact, were able to move forward with it. Another one that we were very proud of was with Etsy. Etsy was on the Dirty Dozen list in 2022 for selling childlike sex abuse dolls. And research has shown that, that child sex abuse dolls can actually increase the likelihood of predators acting out on real children. In March of 2023, Etsy finally added an explicit prohibition of depictions of sexualization of minors to their policies. And we were unable to find or at least not easily find um, any more child sex abuse dolls, sex, sex abuse dolls on the retail site. Um, and also just want to note that Collective Shout and Defend Dignity, close allies of ours, were also part of this campaign. So it was, a, again, showing collective action has an impact. So again, wanted to leave you with some success stories so you could hold on to hope and optimism that change is possible before we present the 2024 Dirty Dozen list.
Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, I must have misspoke. I want to I give mean, you I, the room to misspeak, Mr. Zuckerberg. I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product that's killing people. It is now time to repeal Section 230. The blanket limitation on liabilities, that has to change, and that is on us. at STAP really failed to see that the platform was the perfect tool for sexual predators. Everyone, thank you so much for committing your time to be here with us today. I am Teresa J. Helm, the Survivor Services Coordinator from the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Welcome. Many of us here grew up in an exciting era of playing video games, anything from Atari, Nintendo, to the handheld device Game Boy. We were thrilled at the opportunity that these devices created. Now, as parents, we love to allow our own children to experience in some of the childhood fun that we had. Tragically, the experience has shifted tremendously to online gaming platforms such as Roblox, where due to their gravely inadequate and lack of default safety features, children are regularly being sought out and directly targeted and bombarded with sexually explicit content like rape simulation and other predatory behaviors such as grooming with the intention to exploit and cause harm. Imagine a username that goes unbanned that states raped little girl. Kids 16 and under make up 60% of Roblox demographics with 22% of those users under the age of nine. Roblox has no age restrictions or verifications, and every new account is defaulted to, not up to safety, but to enable access to every, quote, experience. These predators are initiating contact through the text chat option and role-playing games that prove successful at luring children into sexually violent virtual environments that are having enormous and very real life major impacts on the mental, emotional, and physical health of children. As the nightmare grows even darker from that, some children are lured right out of their very own homes. An 11-year-old girl from New Jersey groomed on ro Roblox and kidnapped, taken out of state, a 13-year-old boy from Utah groomed on Roblox, kidnapped and sexually assaulted. A girl under 16 in California, a 14-year-old girl in Ohio, both groomed on Roblox and sexually assaulted. This is the platform that Roblox is choosing, creating, and enabling for its 54 million daily users. Over half are under 13 years old daily. The reality that Roblox has failed to implement protective safety measures as 
basic fundamental standard default protocol is inexplicably dangerous and very directly harmful. Simply put, there is no excuse at all. We need to urge and demand Roblox stop treating child protection like a game. Thank you all so much. And I would like to uh, introduce you to my fearless, wonderful colleague, Peter Gentella, Senior Legal Counsel. Thank you, Teresa. In the fall of 2022, a 17 year old in Ohio took his own life. He was a popular athlete with a bright future. His family and his community were shocked and devastated. Law enforcement later confirmed that the teen was a victim of sexual extortion or sextortion. The perpetrators of this horrible crime told the teen that they would ruin his life and his future if he didn't pay them. Their tool of choice for the sextortion of this young person was the Cash App. Cash App is the most popular e-payment app for young people. It is also the most dangerous. For bad actors, Cash App has become a preferred payment processing app of choice for buying sex, trafficking adults and minors, facilitating sextortion, and buying and selling child sex abuse material. Criminals take advantage of Cash App's ease of use prioritization of anonymity, and quick transfer capabilities to conduct illegal and harmful transactions. The Human Trafficking Institute found that Cash App was the most identified payment platform used in commercial sex transactions with over twice as many documented illegal uses than the second highest platform. At the beginning of this year, a group of whistleblowers contacted federal regulators and shared that Cash App was conducting inadequate due diligence on its customers, making the platform vulnerable to illegal activities such as money laundering and terrorism financing. Sexual abuse and exploitation are easily facilitated through Cash App because of its lack of identity and age verification. For example, teens don't need an adult to create an account if they are only sending peer-to-peer -peer payments. Individuals can also create limitless Cash App accounts on their phone which makes it easier to evade detection. Now, Cash App claims it prohibits its users um, to be younger than 13 years old, and that it requires an adult sponsor for users aged between 13 and 17. But our own research team at Nicosi was able to establish new Cash App accounts and send and receive money without having their ages verified. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation urges Cash App to make compliance and safety a priority immediately, including implementing stringent age and identification verification, truly requiring adult sponsorship at sign up for minor aged accounts and covering all financial services, including peer to peer payments, and enhancing privacy and safety settings for minors. Please join us in telling Cash App that it is time to prioritize safety. Until it does, it will remain the preferred financial application for sexual predators. The next company on this year's Dirty Dozen list will be presented by Tori Rousey, Nicosi's Corporate Advocacy Program Manager and Analyst. Tori, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. I'm gonna be talking about Microsoft's GitHub. GitHub is the largest code hosting platform for version control and collaboration, specifically for generative AI. Generative is AI is everywhere, and I'm sure you've noticed in the past year, but where does it come from? How is this technology created and how do people get access to it? Because of GitHub, it now takes less time to make a cup of Keurig coffee, which is 60 seconds, than it does to create um, AI-generated pornography and sexual abuse content. GitHub lowers the barrier of access to entry to create and use sexually exploitative technology and tools. Anybody can create it. For example, the image you're seeing on the screen right now was created by a 15-year-old boy who found the technology on GitHub, found a community on GitHub, and uh, created this image to collaborate and create a community with other developers on GitHub. Despite GitHub's promise to remove codes, 
such as notification tools in 2019, they still exist and thrive on their platform. In the past year, Nicosi has identified a 20% increase in notification uh, software projects on GitHub. Cases of notification of girls in middle school and high school across the United States, Spain, and across the, the world have been um, everywhere in the news in 2023. Further, GitHub has policies that ban non-consensual content, but what about non-consensual sexually exploitative tools and technology? GitHub is one of the top 10 referral sites for the most prolific deepfake pornography site in the United States. AI-generated CSAM has also been found to be created from tools that uh, were posted on GitHub and created on, uh, on GitHub. It is the number two most popular project on GitHub identified by their own research um, had created AI-generated CSAM in 2023 and 2022. This is also seen externally. Nick Mick received over 4,700 reports of AI-generated CSAM in 2023 alone. GitHub, the top three repositories tagged with deep fakes, uh, have been focused on creating sexually explicit content. Research shows that actually only one in three are pornographic, but GitHub somehow beats all odds. These technology platforms and projects are very popular on GitHub. Please join me in calling on GitHub to disrupt deepfake pornography. It is my pleasure to introduce Megan, our lead policy analyst, who will be talking about our next target, Reddit. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Reddit, our next target, is advertised as a way to find community but it has also allowed the worst kinds of sexual exploiters to find community online. Child sexual abuse material, sex trafficking, and image-based sexual abuse hide in plain sight amongst endless pornography subreddits allowed on this platform. Content which will be further monetized now that Reddit has gone public. This is Reddit's fourth year on Nicosi's Dirty Dozen list, and we have yet to see significant change in their practices to protect users from sexual exploitation and abuse. On March 21st, 2024, Reddit went public, despite the fact that this incredibly popular platform with 73 million active users each day remains a cesspool of image-based sexual abuse, hardcore pornography, prostitution, and child sexual abuse material. The problem is so severe on Reddit that it was even cited in a 2023 Forbes article, how real people are caught in Reddit's AI porn explosion. Although Reddit did make some changes to their policies in preparation to go public, the policies are pretty on paper, but not being used. New policies prohibit the sexualization of minors, sharing of non-consensual content, and the sharing of AI-generated pornography. While Reddit did improve, improve blurring mechanisms for sexual content, content and communities allowed to remain on the platform are focused on the sharing of non-consensual content, encouraging sexual violence against women, sexualization of minors, and AI-generated pornography, all in violation of their new policies. Their policy also excludes the regulation of AI-generated pornography of non-identifiable individuals, which is complete and utter nonsense. There is no way to prove this, and the images are cobbled together with images of identifiable people, leading to very real mental, psychological, and physical harms. The companies developing AI pornography generators are using Reddit to train their models, knowing that there is an abundance of pornographic content and CSAM to pull from. During its soft launch in July 2023, Unstable Diffusion CEO and co-founder stated that their model to create AI pornography, initially launched on Reddit, was generating 500,000 images a day. Reddit was also found as a source of CSAM used to train the model by Stanford Internet Observatory researchers, now adding to the proliferation of child sexual abuse material on the internet. Reddit also announced a partnership with Google this year, disclosed in their S1 filing with the SEC, which is expected to generate $66.4 million by the end of this year, which allows Google to train AI models using Reddit's content. This arrangement is particularly alarming, given Reddit's historical challenges with proactively identifying and eliminating sexually explicit content, including abusive and illegal imagery. Not only is Reddit facilitating this abuse, it is aggressively monetizing it. 
Please join me and our team in taking action on our Reddit webpage to rally around significant Reddit reforms. And with that, I would like to pass the baton to one of my personal heroes, Tim Nestor, and Cozy's Senior Director of Communications to present the next Dirty Dozen List target. Thanks, Meg. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm here to talk about Apple, which is kind of a surprising one for a lot of people, I realize, but they've been on the list before. This is not um, this is not new for us with the struggles that Apple has had to safeguard kids online. Their record is rotten when it comes to child protection. The big tech titan refuses to detect child sexual abuse material and hosts dangerous apps with deceptive age ratings and descriptions. And as a parent, that is especially concerning because I feel like my wife and I do everything that we can to protect our kids and to use all the safety features that are available to us. And I know that we're in the minority. We recently heard that Snap and Discord both told Congress that less than 1% of parents that have access to these tools even use them. So the small minority of parents that even use these protective tools, they're still not enough. Uh, as you can see here in the example, there was a deep swap uh, AI video, a Nudify app that kids could access if they were over the age of four which is ridiculous. The explicit apps that are available to them that slip through the cracks of the app store, and it's not just Apple, it's many app stores, uh, they slip through the cracks and kids have access to them. So even the most concerned and, and vigilant parent, um, they can't protect their kids in every single circumstance. Uh, the failure of Apple to properly rate these apps, it proves that yes, the onus is on parents, to protect their kids. My wife and I take that job very seriously. We wanna protect our kids in every way that we can. If you can relate to this, when a kid brings a new device to me, the first thing I do is open up settings, start going through all the different parental controls that I can, ticking all the boxes of what their age is and what's appropriate for them. And then I make an assumption at that point as a parent that they're safe. And in this case, it's not always true. There have been kids who have been exposed to explicit content and these Nudify apps uh, because of the lack of um, consistency with the ratings. Now, I do want to be the first to celebrate a 2024 victory with the Dirty Dozen list. Apple responded within a couple of weeks of our request for them to remove these Nudify apps and removed the ones that we highlighted for them. So that is a huge victory. And I think that's something that's worth celebrating and worth thanking Apple for, that they are responding. They're paying attention when it's raised to them. That being said, I don't believe that it's our job to do Apple's job. I think they should be doing this. And as nice as it is that they listen to us, we want them to take action before this ever becomes a problem. So we wanna celebrate, but also ask them, take these steps before it gets in front of kids. We also wanna support the efforts of the HEAT initiative and in calling on Apple to detect CSAM on iCloud and to create a robust reporting mechanism for users. This is simple, this is straightforward, it makes sense, it's no nonsense. So join us in supporting that HEAT initiative as well. And make sure you check out our webpage um, on dirtydozenlist.com and go to the Apple page and you can join us in appealing to them to safeguard children. So head over to the, head over to the website, take action now. It won't take more than a couple of minutes to, uh, to let your voice be heard. And I want to take uh, a minute now to pass it on to Danny Pinter, our Senior Legal Counsel in the Nicosi Law Center. Thanks, Tim. We have a bit of an unusual target today. We are elevating misinterpretations of a law called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Now we're elevating this today because big tech has abused the protections under Section 230, which were provided as the language of the statute states for Good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. But what is more offensive than child sexual abuse material? Yet platforms like Twitter have hidden behind such immunity even for its own knowing distribution of such material. When Twitter was confronted by our young client, their response to this child was, we have reviewed the material, which depicted him at 13 years old, and did not find a violation of our policies. And then Twitter continued to allow this child pornography to be retweeted, liked, comment, commented on, and distributed. Um, they profited from this user engagement and ad revenue gathered by that activity. How can a statute passed to incentivize the protection of children be turned on its head to instead insulate platforms, facilitating and exacerbating harm to children? Today, the most profitable and most influential country corporations in the world enjoy immunity from liability unlike any other industry. And big tech is constantly 
pushing courts to adopt interpretations of 230 that would broaden this immunity further and further. And they send, spend millions of dollars to lobby against Section 230 reform. It is time to stop listening to big tech. It is time for Section 230 reform, and that is all of our responsibility. It is time we tell Congress we want change. Big tech wants the world to believe that without Section 230, the internet would fail and the online ecosystem would collapse. But we know this is a lie. Lawsuits have not killed the car manufacturing industry, for example, but instead resulted in safety features like seat belts and airbags. Litigation hasn't even ended the tobacco industry, but without litigation, the tobacco industry would still be lying to its customers and claiming its products are safe. And no immunity does not even mean com companies will automatically be liable. It only means victims get their day in court. And every family whose child was trafficked online or whose lives have been ruined or even lost due to known and preventable harms on online platforms deserve that chance. So although Section 230 is an unusual target for our Dirty Dozen list, we are elevating the misinterpretations of this law because all of big tech uses it as a shield to avoid accountability and an excuse not to make their products safe. And so now we all need to step up. This is a call to the American people and to Congress to make change to that big tech won't. If we want accountability for most of the targets on this list, we need Section 230 reform. So take action today, go to our website, and send a message to Congress that you want Section 230 reform. Thanks. Thank you so much to Danny and my incredible colleagues. Um, you can see that we are a powerful force. I just really quickly want to go over the rest of the targets. We want to elevate uh, the ones that you previously heard about for various reasons, but again, to highlight some of the reasons why we chose um, the remaining targets for the Dirty Dozen list. Of course, you can go to our web pages to learn a lot more about them. You can read the notification letters that we send the corporations that include a lot of the evidence and recommendations for change. You can see the evidence that we have collected as well as allies have elevated. Um, and we also include a lot, a lot of additional reading and resources. So just to briefly highlight Meta, certainly uh, not a newcomer to the Dirty Dozen list. Um, we really wanted to continue pushing on Meta for several reasons. It is still arguably the most dangerous app for kids. And actually all of Meta's family of apps are consistently named as among the most dangerous, Instagram in particular. We uh, saw even this year that Instagram um, was found to be hosting pedophile networks and, and Instagram was actually pushing these networks and connecting pedophiles to each other through the algorithm. This is actually something that we raised with Instagram several years ago, but we were very grateful to the Wall Street Journal and the Stanford Internet Observatory for further pushing um, on this investigation and elevating it. But too often, Meta only makes changes when they do get negative press um, and when there is pressure from policymakers, for example, invitations to testify in front of congressional hearings. We also felt it was critical to continue elevating the fact that despite being so dangerous, rather than making truly substantive changes to make their platform safer, Meta decided to roll out end-to-end -end encryption this year. And basically what that does is blind meta to some of the most egregious harms happening on their platforms. It blinds them to detecting, for example, child sex abuse material through Messenger. This sets a very dangerous precedent that we know that others are already pointing to as an excuse for why they too can roll out end-to-end -end encryption. A new target this year is Cloudflare. Cloudflare provides basic web infrastructure to some of the largest, most well-known sex buyer review boards. Review boards are, are, are called that because men are reviewing women like products, women that they purchase for sex. Um, they also host many other prostitution sites or so-called escort sites. Um, and these are sites that are known to be facilitating sex trafficking, not to mention facilitating prostitution, which is illegal in across the United States, except a few counties in Nevada. So they are providing the infrastructure um, for these built for exploitation platforms. Um, and we know that sex buyers drive the demand, which fuels the commercial sex industry and fosters sex trafficking. 
Cloudflare also supports sites that host deep fake pornography tools, not merely deep fake imagery, but the actual tools to create deep fake pornography, which you heard is proliferating at really disturbing rates. So by providing um, various services, content delivery networks, domain name systems, and web application firewalls, Cloudflare is enabling illegal and harmful activities to thrive. They are essential in keeping these exploitative sites operational. And in fact, none of them could function at their current scale without Cloudflare. Last point on Cloudflare, in August 2023, a Bloomberg review found that 13 of the top 20 deep fake websites are currently using Cloudflare services. Discord has been on the dirty dozen list since COVID, where it went from being maybe a lesser known platform used primarily for gaming to becoming very widespread. Um, we have received more calls about Discord than any other platform in the past few years. Um, it's a hotspot for dangerous interactions uh, between adults and minors, and also now for hosting deep fakes. It's rampant with grooming, child sex abuse, selling, trading, and sharing, um, and again, various forms of image-based sexual abuse. Now, Discord actually was a win from this year because they changed their policies, and the policy change itself was like quite good, and we were all set to applaud Discord. They were going to automatically be blurring sexually explicit content for minors. Again, a common sense measure, but one that not many platforms have adopted. And we actually reached out to Discord saying, you know, we want to celebrate this. We want to remove you from the watch list. And we were having some back and forth. And then when we shared with them that our tests actually repeated tests showed that their policies were failing. And when we elevated that we were finding servers dedicated to image-based sexual abuse, including one that was hosting 47 events in one day dedicated to um, deepfake pornography with 24,000 members, we never heard back. We continued to try to reach out to them. And the next we heard their CEO, um, Jason Citron, was testifying in front of Congress in January, lauding all of these policies and how incredible they are knowing full well that none of them worked, thereby lying to Congress and the American public. So rather than removing Discord or putting it on the watch list, we are keeping them on the dirty dozen list. Telegram. Telegram might be lesser known here in the United States, but it's growing in popularity and is very popular um, and widely used throughout the rest of the world. Um, it is becoming known, especially among law enforcement, as the dark web alternative. And I have to tell you, um, my colleagues and I truly find Telegram terrifying, even having done this work for many years. The things that we saw, the things that we read about the type of um, exploitation and the, the the sadistic forms of exploitation happening on Telegram, um, as well as a whole a whole host of other harms, um, we really feel strongly that we needed to elevate this app and encourage the Department of Justice to be looking at it, as well as Apple and Google app stores, investigating it immediately um, and potentially remove it, given how uh, prolific the harms are to children and adults. LinkedIn might be a surprise and possibly even uh, raise some eyebrows why, you know, we're talking about Telegram and widespread abuses, um, and then we're, we elevate LinkedIn. Well, one of the main purposes of Dirty Dozen List and the goal of Nicosi's is to tackle the full spectrum of sexual abuse and exploitation and make that point that they are all interlinked and connected, and to call out corporations um, that really, sh really should not be hosting, no corporation should be hosting any type of sexual abuse and exploitation, but we certainly don't expect places like, like LinkedIn to be hosting um, and perpetuating sexual abuse and exploitation. So we found that LinkedIn is providing a platform for many exploitative um, companies, most particular Pornhub, which I'm sure many of you know has been found um, to be to host child sex abuse material, sex trafficking, a host of harms. Hundreds of survivors have stepped forward. There are multiple lawsuits against Pornhub for these harms, including by our own Nicosi Law Center. And LinkedIn is normalizing them as a job like any other, as a company as any other. And we can't allow um, 
exploitative corporations like Pornhub, like OnlyFans, like seeking to have a platform on, on LinkedIn and give the impression that, that these are, um, you know, benign corporations and, and to give them a platform to further the work that they're doing. Um, we also found deep fake bots being advertised on LinkedIn and a, a host of articles kind of lauding the benefits of deep fake pornography. And in fact, a Nicosi staff member received a comment from a nudifying bot promoter um, just a few weeks ago stating how if the apps are used correctly, the deep fake pornog pornography apps are used correctly, they're not dangerous. Um, and then lastly, I was particularly um, enraged when I learned that one survey found that 91% of women received romantic or sexual advances and sexual harassment on LinkedIn. This is unacceptable. Um, in the post Me Too world, this is a place where women are elevating their professional successes and um, it just feels like no place is safe. And at the very least, LinkedIn should be a safe place for women and everybody to be um, celebrating their accomplishments without the threat of sexual harassment. So LinkedIn can certainly do better. Spotify also was on the list last year. This was actually, um, I'd say, surprised everybody the most, both the, our own team um, and uh, the general public when we put Spotify on the list. And this was not for you know, racy album covers or questionable lyrics. We were shocked to find extensive hardcore pornography in profile accounts, in Spotify playlists. There was evidence that was coming out that playlists were also being used as a method to groom children. This was, again, one of those targets where people don't expect it from Spotify. More and more understand that Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok have a lot of problems, rampant exploitation, but Spotify, no. So we were also greatly dismayed that Spotify really didn't make any substantive changes. And in fact, when we went back um, to investigate Spotify throughout the year, we actually discovered what appears to be a vast network. And we were talking thousands, possibly tens of thousands, given the numbers that we found of both minors and adults trading, sharing, soliciting, and posting hardcore pornography, a lot of which looked like child sex abuse material. Um, there was sharing of deep fake pornography of female celebrities and even self-harm imagery. So again, a network on Spotify trading child sex abuse material. And there, is, there isn't even a way to report it on Spotify, on the app itself. This is an industry standard that literally can save children's lives um, if properly, uh, if, if there's proper reporting apps working with law enforcement and agencies like the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children. So, so if I did make some few updates on paper um, and prohibiting repeatedly targeting minor to shame or intimidate but words on paper mean nothing without enforcement. And from what we can tell, Spotify is not enforcing anything. And lastly, the watch list. Uh, the watch list is reserved for entities that were on the dirty dozen list in previous years and made some policies, but that we're still monitoring to ensure that implementation is truly happening um, and or that still pose a significant enough risk um, to children and, and adults and that we want to continue elevating those harms. Um, Snapchat, again, to their credit, was actually, did make a lot of changes after we put them on the dirty dozen list and responded to us and our concerns. For example, they made it much harder for prostitution and pornography bots um, and links to be present in the public sections of Snapchat. They promised to reduce the amount of sexualized content on the Discover and Stories sections. So again, made a lot of changes that we asked for, but notably did not make any changes to our knowledge to the most dangerous aspect of the app where all of the exploitation happens um, between the individuals and that's the chats, the snaps themselves. Um, Snapchat's again, consistently rated as the top app for extortion, for sexual interactions between minors and adults, for sharing of child sex abuse material. Um, this is a very dangerous, very dangerous app despite the changes they made. And sadly, we also found that even the promised changes um, 
they're not being implemented as they should. We created new accounts as 13 and 14 year olds and immediately without even searching, were exposed to videos of women pole dancing with headings, my new job, um, a very graphic story about what women want in bed, again, for a 13 year old together with alcohol promotion to set the mood, teen girls grabbing teenage boys, private areas while in the bathroom, the list goes on. So Snapchat still has a lot of work to do. Um, we need to continue pressing on them. So those are the targets of the 2024 Dirty Dozen list. Before I invite my colleagues back on screen for some discussion and Q&A, I wanted to invite my corporate advocacy colleague, um, Tori, to just share how people can take action, because we know people might have to start leaving, and this is the core purpose of the Dirty Dozen list. So we want to make sure we elevate and, and let people know how you can take action to galvanize um, galvanize change. Tori? Hello, everybody. I just wanted to take a moment to talk to you about a really powerful tool that we all have at our disposal, which is our voice and our ability to drive change. The Dirty Dozen List has not only highlighted entities that profit from sexual abuse and exploitation for over a decade, um, leading to significant policy and cultural shifts, but that wouldn't have been possible without you and, and your voices. Consider this. A single letter can represent the voices of a thousand customers. And no, that's not just a number or something that I made up. That's actually what Hilton told us when we called on them to end on-demand and in-room pornography viewing, which led them to reach out to us begging to uh, stop the, the letters they were receiving. And then they promised change, and that change led to an industry-wide standard against on-demand pornography viewing in hotel rooms. From Hilton to corporations on this year's Dirty, Dirty Dozen list already reaching out to us, like Cash App and Cloudflare, your actions make a real difference, and they are a true catalyst for change. When you speak up, whether as a consumer, a shareholder, a concerned citizen, companies do listen, and the voices... Um, are heard by press and policymakers, and they do lead to real change. Um, we've even been told by corporations such as Google and Snapchat that because of your actions and your voices, that they were um, ignited and inspired to make real change in their companies. Your involvement helps open doors for us and our allies to engage with these companies, um, and then it draws media attention, which really amplifies the impact and, and what needs to be done. It also provides opportunities to present evidence for policymakers and legislators, and we just Thank you for all you've done, and we ask for your continued support. To take action, please go to dirtydozenlist.com, and you're going to see a list of all of our 12 targets. You can click on a target, and you should see a little box that comes up, and it says take action, and then you can take action um, for that specific target. It takes about 30 seconds um, to take action, so we'd really appreciate it if, if you could do that. And thank you so much for your continued support over the last over a decade, um, and thank you. Thank you, Tori. Now I'll invite all of my colleagues to join me for some Q&A. And I'm getting a lot of questions in the chat and people even texting me. Yes, we will share that powerful video, of course, and we want you to share it because again, it's not just you taking actions, but share it with your networks. And maybe it's not the entire Dirty Dozen list, but even if you share at least one target, it will help get the word out to people. So it just wanted to, um, actually, I'm going to start with you, Meg, because we just received some exciting news. You know, we have to hold all these corporations accountable, you know, individually, and we target them individually. But as I believe Danny noted, there's a, it's an entire ecosystem of exploitation. And we see this very clearly, even in how um, predators will use multiple apps. You know, we see cases where, uh, someone is posting sex trafficking victims on one of the sex buyer sites that Cloudflare supports, and then they put Cash App, you know, as the form of payment, and then they'll advertise um, also on you know Discord or Telegram, where someone will meet a predator will lure a child on Roblox, but then move them to Snapchat, which is quieter, but then again share then those images um, across Meta and Instagram. So. This ecosystem needs to be addressed. And one of the best ways to do that is through legislation. So uh, Meg, can you share the recent use um, and just tie it, again, tie, tie it in with any other legislative initiatives that really will help us um, hold these corporations accountable for the harms that they perpetuate? 
Absolutely, Lena. So last night we received some really, really exciting news. The Kids Online Safety Act, which is one of the best legislative solutions to protect children online and will really force platforms like Reddit, who have not made significant changes, to take action, was introduced in the House of Representatives by Representative Bilirakis, Representative Castor, Representative Houchin, and Representative Schreier. This is very exciting. The Senate bill introduced by Blackburn and Blumenthal has 67 co-sponsors. And so we've been waiting to see it move in the House. And we are so excited about how quickly this is going. COSA would create a duty of care to force these platforms to consider children in their design and also really places common sense measures on children's accounts and parents' accounts to help parents kind of see what their children are up to. Another legislative solution that I want to hire, or excuse me, highlight um, is Earn It Act. Earn It would reform and Section 230 to make sure that victims of CSAM online are able to get recompense for the crimes that have been committed against them. They're able to find justice. And CDA 230 will actually be heard in the House Energy and Commerce Committee tomorrow. They're having a hearing. So lots of things happening this week on the legislative front, and we're very, very excited about it. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Meg. And just want to make sure that our listeners know that among the actions, you know, most of them are geared towards the executives, the corporations themselves, but we do also have actions geared towards policymakers. So, for example, you'll see in the meta actions, and that includes Instagram, um, direct actions, asking the House to prioritize COSA, asking um, Congress to prioritize EARN IT, and a whole package of child online safety bills. So, again, when you're taking action, you are also reaching out to policymakers. Um, Tori, a question that we always get is how do we choose the targets on the Dirty Dozen list? Yes. So this is kind of a year-long process. We reach out to survivors, law enforcement, allies, uh, and in reach from supporters, especially parents. We really want to hear from parents and just monitoring what they are seeing and like what their kids are experiencing. We do lots of research and evidence collection. We even pose as minors, um, which gives us a really good insight to how kids are experiencing social media platforms or just online platforms in general. Um, and we also look at which companies have large market shares. So for example, Apple, Microsoft, and Meta, you probably know that those are all on our list this year or companies uh, part of their families of apps. Um, and we elevate a variety of issues. So it's not necessarily that one on the list is worse than the other or more egregious than the other, but um, because we do elevate all the different issues like sexual harassment on LinkedIn, um, we want to make sure that we cover everything kind of under the sun and in which ones are currently facilitating sexual abuse and exploitation. But just because it's on the list doesn't mean they're doing better or worse or that we're not continuing to work with them. Thank you, Tori. Yes, it's important. Many people think that maybe this is a top 12 list. It's not a top 12 list. It really is just to elevate different targets for various reasons that Tori outlined. Um, Danny, are there concrete actions that Congress is currently taking to amend Communications Decency Act Section 230? Well, like Meg said, um, Congress is currently um, considering earn it um, for the second time. And so we, you know, your letters, the taking action um, as part of this dirty dozen list will keep the pressure on Congress, right? Earn it is so narrow. Um, I talked about our client um, whose child sexual abuse material Twitter knew is on its platform and continue to distribute it. I mean, it's common sense that they that they should have to at least face our client court because of that, right? Um, so that's all that Earn It would do. Um, very common sense. And of course, big tech's been fighting it all the way. Um, so that's why we need your voice um, to keep the pressure on Congress. And, um, you know, just want to highlight again that um, the Ener Energy and Commerce Committee is actually doing a where is 230 now? You know, this law was passed in 1996. Um, does it still make sense? Um, the way that it's been interpreted, is that right? So it's a very key time um, for your voice to be heard on this issue. Thank you, Danny. Um, Tim, you touched on this. Another question that we always get is, um, or a pushback that we receive, including from the companies themselves, is that it's parents' responsibility to protect their children. How do you respond to that? 
I mean, it's true. It is the parent's responsibility. As a parent, I take that responsibility very seriously. But as I shared when we talked about Apple, we can do everything within our power, check every box, toggle on every safety feature, and it's still not enough because some of these platforms are just more interested in profit, being on the cutting edge of technology than they are in protecting every kid that's out there. Um, I think in some ways that's collateral they're willing to accept because of the money that's there to be made. And the deals that are there to be made with these apps and these software companies that are making a lot of money uh, off of our families and our kids. And I don't hold that part against them that they're making money. But when it comes at the expense of our kids and their safety and their mental health, that's when there's a problem. And so I think it usually comes down to profit as well as they don't want to allocate resources and time and effort to that. It's going to slow down their next step in technology advances. So I think that's part of it as well. And then can I just jump into Lena? Because you know, in other industries, like we all have personal responsibility and parents, of course, have responsibility for their children. But um, we would be appalled if, you know, Tylenol and Advil didn't have safety caps because they know children tend to put pills in their mouth and that could cause harm. Right. We don't when when we expect companies to protect against known dangers. Um, this is just right. This is standard common sense. This is how this is. This is the responsibility of the company. That's their responsibility. Um, so, you know, all we're asking is that they actually um, live up to their responsibilities instead of trying to shift the burden to something that's impossible for parents, because only Apple knows its platform inside and out, not parents. Perfect. That's exactly right. And as a parent of four, I feel the same way, even being in these apps day in, day out, I cannot keep track. Um, they need to protect all children, whether or not they have the privilege of involved, informed parents or parents at all. Um, someone asked, is, again, some like moving, connecting with what Tim was saying, why would Apple remove only a few deep fake apps from their app store and not all of them? We ask Apple those exact same questions. Um, they removed the ones that we publicize or sent to them because I think they also know that we make those pu those letters public and we're going to push them. Um, the answer almost always is profit. I think they just do the bare minimum. And this is not just Apple. It's across the board. It's They do the bare minimum that when they receive pushback, when they receive um, the bad press or policymakers are starting to crack down and rather than making the whole scale substantive change. And I think that Apple did, um, you yeah, know, and we celebrated it as a win. They proactively, uh, we asked them to default a tool that proactively blurs sexually explicit content for 12 and under. So before it wasn't put on as a default. So they turned that on, but we've asking them, why are they not protecting teenagers? Are teenagers not worthy of being protected from sexually explicit content or receiving warnings, especially when we know that 87% of teens have in the US have iPhones and we're simultaneously hearing about you know, sextortion being on the rise, CSAM being on the rise. So again, they just they make drip drop changes. So we have to hold their feet to the fire. And again, we need legislation and we need lawsuits to force them to make the changes that they are not making willingly. Um, I wanted to end asking Teresa, to who works with survivors and families of survivors, um, how, can, how can we support survivor advocates um, even better? And, and again, I think we're seeing this groundswell of parents, um, in particular, recognizing the harms of social media and gaming platforms. Um, tragically, we know families have even lost their children. Um, and we're also seeing, again, an uptick of survivors of image-based sexual abuse. How can we support them? Yeah, thank you, Lena. So, you know, supporting survivors, you know, that's the thing about a survivor. They're, they're a survivor because they've gone through it already. Um, so we can support them having gone through such tragedies, whether it was themselves going through it or their families, their children, um, by continuing to urge the change, you know, by continuing to, uh, crowd around and try to lift up their stories and demand the change happens, um, we, can support them by protecting our own children. And, and as I said, 
urging the these platforms to do the basic right thing to do, which is to protect children also so that we can prevent more people from becoming survivors of, you know, image based sexual abuse, sex extortion. Um, tragically, if a child takes their own life because they just have not been able to handle the pressures of what they've gone through. And it just brings so much chaos to, you know, society as a whole, when we are not, um, when these companies are just allowing, enabling, perpetuating, almost pushing this way of life for our kids. You know, we're living in this time where we've never faced what we're facing currently and our children out there now. So we can support survivors by, like I said, continuing to push for change, urging, taking all the actions that are there to take and, and not stopping, not do it once, do it twice, do it until the change has happened. You know, we don't, we don't want to see another hearing where these parents are, you know, their heart is dangling broken from these posters that they've held up of their children that they've lost. You know, it, it's tragic. And so we'll support them and continue to support them um, by rallying around them and, and um, demanding all the change to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And what an inspiring way to close. I hope that that inspired you to take action right after this webinar. It will take you less than two minutes to take all of the actions that we have made so easy for you um, to, to take, to press, press for change. Um, again, dirtydozenlist.com. Please take the actions. Please share it with at least one of your friends, a family member, review the tools and resources and the evidence, um, and stay tuned for the victories that I know are going to come. Thank you so much for joining us in this fight for a world where everyone can love and live free of exploitation and abuse. Thank you.